This is the great chamber of the Charter House where Elizabeth I held her first Council of State in 1558 and where indeed James VI and I held his first Council of State in 1603. This is where he dubbed the 80 Knights. Elizabeth, at her accession, was under house arrest at Hatfield, where you were last October, and um, she came straight from there to the Charter House, coming in through the back door, ankles deep in mud, we're told, and she held her first Privy Council here, which had been organized by Cecil. The house at the time was owned by Edward Lord North. When the Carthusian monastery here was dissolved in the mid-1530s, all the Carthusian monasteries in this country were called charter houses. Kevin is right, nothing to do with Chartres. When it was dissolved, the building stayed empty for a few years and was used as a storeroom for Henry VIII's tilt at Smithfield. And then in 1540, when Henry VIII married Anne of Cleves, invited over from Venice were a family of court musicians who were, of course, the Bassanos, and they were billeted in the empty monastery of the Charter House, and they were allocated monk cells, all six brothers of them, and Baptista, Amelia's dad, was in cell Z next to the laundry. <laughs> now, here they lived very happily for five years, minding their own business and making their own musical instruments in the cloister. And um, then in 1545, their lives were rather turned upside down because Henry VIII sold the Charter House at a knockdown price to Sir Edward North, as he then was. Now, he was the treasurer of the Court of Augmentations, meaning that he was in charge of the money which had come from the dissolved monastic houses. And the first thing Edward North did was to pull the monastery down and build a fine mansion in its place in which we're sitting today and um, with the building materials of the monastery. And in fact, he didn't manage to evict the Bassanos for seven years. He didn't get rid of them until um, uh, uh, 1552. Uh, but he moved in his own family and his second son was Thomas North, who all of us know later on went to translate um, Plutarch's parallel lives of the Greeks and Romans and is now himself an authorship candidate. Uh, now, Thomas would have been 12 when his father bought the Charter House and he lived here on and off until he was 31, until 1564 when his father died. And then the Charter House was sold to Thomas Howard, 4th Duke of Norfolk. Little T, as he was called by his family, including his first cousin, Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford, who would have been 15 when his older cousin uh, turned the Charter House into Howard House. And the um, building that we're in, and particularly the great chamber that we're in, owes an enormous amount to the Duke of Norfolk. So forget about the Stuart portraits around the wall. They're obviously too late for us. Um, although you might um, have a glance at a copy of the Sib portrait of Elizabeth I up there. The man on her right I'll tell you about later. Um, but all the um, ceiling decorations belong to uh, the Dukes of Norfolk. So there's his garter in the center there. Um, further along on my left are the Howard arms quartered with the arms of Edward the Confessor for which his father, the poet Surrey, had been executed. And then there are the um, Fitzalan arms um, from his first wife and his motto over there by the window, Solus Virtus Invicta. And um, he put in the fireplace. 
although it was painted later in Charles I's time by a man called Bucket. <laughs> now, this bit of the ceiling came down in the Blitz and it had, was reconstructed. But the bit of the ceiling in the alcove there is original and it is sprinkled with the thistles of Scotland because the Duke of Norfolk entered into marriage negotiations with Mary, Queen of Scots, and uh, he thought he was going to become King of Scots. <laughs> Elizabeth came here um, to stay for four days um, at the start of one of her progresses in 1571, and um, she went from here to Cambridge. And while she was at Cambridge, she heard that her recent host had become involved in the Ridolfi plot. And uh, Little T was playing tennis in his real tennis court off the cloister. And he came in from his match and he found a guard waiting for him. And during the year he was under house arrest here at um, Howard House, his guardian was Sir Henry Neville. I wonder what they talked about. <laughs> a year later, he was executed, and his cousin Oxford sat in on his trial. And at his execution, his dukedom was attainted. All the Howard lands were confiscated by the crown, except the Charter House, which came into the hands of his second son, who was then called Lord Thomas Howard, who didn't like it very and he rented it out to various people. Um, and then eventually in 1611, he sold it to the most important person in the entire history of the Charter House without any question at all. And that person was Volpone. There's a bust of him in the window. And then in the alcove, there is a picture of him looking rather like Roy Strong, I think. <laughs> Now, I haven't got time to tell you about um, uh, th this particular man. All Johnsonian scholars agree that the inspiration for Volpone was the richest commoner in the country who was called Thomas Sutton. And there is an excellent article in the De Vere Society newsletter of 2016 by Jan Cole pointing out the connections between Johnson, Sutton, and indeed Oxford um, in Hackney. And um, Sutton had come by and made a number of fortunes in his life. And the last one of which was in money lending. It was in usury, which was legalized about 30 years before. And when he died, he left a fortune of over 60,000 pounds, which is about 35 million in our money. And um, he'd had rather a dodgy life, but he had a very admirable death because he left his entire fortune for the setting up of an almshouse for old men like me, 80 of them, and a school for poor boys, 40 poor boys, um, who quickly became rather rich boys and took off to Surrey. And um, the will was contested, and it was contested by his nephew, who was called Simon Baxter. And Simon Baxter, during the case that followed, was represented by the Attorney General, Francis Bacon, while the governors of the Charter House were represented by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, who was Bacon's great rival and indeed nemesis, Sir Edward Cook. And uh, obviously the governors won, didn't they? Whereupon Bacon wrote a very long letter to James I, objecting to the establishment of the Charter House. First of all, he said the house was far too grand. It was a prince's residence. And then he said that um, no respectable old gentleman would be seen dead in an almshouse. They'd be too ashamed to be thought of as beggars. So people like retired merchants and distressed and penniless clergymen who ought to be coming to it wouldn't be because they would rather hide obscurely with their private friends. And a lot of riffraff would come in, cast off serving um, um, drunks and uh, wastrels, and he knew this would be the case because that is exactly what had happened to the military knights at Windsor who had ended up as a lot of old drunks. And uh, then he objected to the school. He thought there were far too many grammar schools in the country and um, he thought that there were too many educated people being turned out for 
not enough educated employment. That sounds familiar. Um, and um, he tried to scupper the setting up of the Charter House. Ironically, a few years later, he became a governor of the Charter House <laughs> in 1619 until he was removed from public office in 1621. Uh, now, I, I end on this. Um, we're not really a religious foundation anymore. There are morning and evening prayers, which were entirely voluntary. Not many people go to them. Um, I used to sometimes take evening prayers because there was no one else around. I'm not in holy orders. And um, when I did, I always read out one of the prayers written by Francis Bacon because I hope very much by now he will approve of, of what we are and what we're doing. And um, so, as you see, the room that you're sitting in and the building that you're going to spend the day in was known to many of the people who some of us spend a great deal of time thinking about. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>